All right, well, welcome to Fridays with Feldman. And today um, we are going to see if our technology is improving for this, but basically we're gonna give it a try and see how you like it. But today's discussion is gonna be about hip pain. And I'm gonna try to narrow down hip pain in multiple weeks during this, and maybe multiple Feldman with Fr Fridays with Feldman will be on hip pain. But today we'll discuss the hip dysplasia as a cause of hip pain. Um, so obviously hip pain is a pretty common ailment, and it can be many, many uh, conditions actually that cause hip pain. You could have overuse, you do a lot of yoga, and you're stretching your hip a lot, or you play ball too often, and you're not stretching afterwards. You could have a trauma, meaning that you could kick a soccer ball, and all of a sudden you can tear a muscle off your hamstring, off the bone, or your rectus femoris, which is a muscle in the front. Um, you can have some arthritis in the joint, you're a golfer and you can really twist your hip and develop a labral tear and we'll talk about that at once as well. Um, but a very common cause of needing a hip replacement in, old, in people between the ages of 40 and probably 55 is unrecognized hip dysplasia, which means a shallow hip. This is dysplasia of cancer, like you hear uh, from other types of surgeons. This is a dysplasia of shallowness. The hip itself is shallow. And we're going to talk about that because it could also be too deep. There's also other assorted conditions that can give people um, hip pain. And, we'll be, and we discussed one a couple weeks ago called Perthes disease. And we also have femoral epiphysis. But those don't need to be going into. We're going to be discussing hip dysplasia. So the maximum or the most extreme form of hip dysplasia would be a hip dislocation. Hip is actually out at birth and the child needs to be treated. Well, that's obvious. The hip is out and most likely the child either walks with a limp or the, the pediatrician notices that the motion is not good in the hip. And therefore, um, we treat that as pediatric orthopedic surgeons very young. But I treat the hip dysplasia from the age of newborns all the way to the age to 65 or even 70 because hip dysplasia can be And it's not always so, it's not location. But if it is dislocated in a newborn baby, then we treat it these ways, we put it back in, and it's called developmental dysplasia of the hip. And it's often associated also with a shallow hip. This is just an x-ray of a normal x-ray, if you can see the picture, and showing the round, the round ball in the deep socket. And the socket is called your acid. And the, the thigh bone head is called the femoral head. And there's all these angles that we measure that make it pretty obvious um, when it's shallow. So what makes, what is at risk? When are people at risk for having shallow hips? So you're at risk when you're a firstborn, when you're a girl, when you're a woman. Presentation. You have a family, excuse me, you have a family history of it. Perhaps the child, the mother did not have enough uh, fluid in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the uterus, and that's called oligohydraminous in the placenta, where there's not enough fluid. Left side is more common than right side. And if it's associated with something else, then perhaps with the patient, but most of the time, hip dysplasia we find in healthy young women, more commonly women than men, between the ages of 16 and I would say 45 is the common age that I treated in. Well, we wanted to find the pain. Obviously, is there pain? When are you getting pain? When you're sitting, when you're walking, when you're taking your car, when you're taking a hike, when you're leaning forward, when you're in bed. So all these things help us understand, is it a shallow hip or is the hip too deep? Why is this hip hurting? And obviously the goal is to have a functioning hip that is, that is moving normally and that is and normally. And we'll discuss that as we go along. So these are two forms of hip dysplasia that I would consider. The one on your, on your left is, a, um, is basically when the hip is too shallow. And so what happens is this ball is in a very shallow, sh shallow socket and you're hitting it, hitting it, hitting it in one spot. And that one spot is getting worn out. And that's why you're getting it at a later age. Maybe not in childhood, maybe not till you're 35, maybe not till you're 45 do you have pain in the hip, but it's because you have a shallow hip. Or do you have too deep a socket and the rim is just hitting up against the side of it? Well, that can also cause a arthritic changes and pain in your hip and perhaps a torn labrum. So in acetabular dysplasia, like in this hip, you are bearing weight on one specific spot and eventually you get a labral tear. Well, the labrum holds the hip in the joint. If you go for hip arthritis, this, 
and they repair the labor or take it out, either it re-tears again in a couple weeks or a couple months, or it even makes the hip worse and you're even more unstable. So that's not a solution for this. You can develop cysts if it's too long and eventually you'll get arthritis and eventually you'll need a hip replacement. The question is, can I avoid, can you avoid the hip replacement? Salvage the hip. So when you looked at this, when we looked at someone who had hip replacements, we saw that this was probably half of the cases of younger people between the ages, I told you, 16 to 60, who have hip replacements, have it because their hip is shallow. All these other reasons we don't have to go into today. Hip impingement, and that's the second most common cause. And I would call that dysplasia as well. So these are the mechanical causes. And all this is very technical. Basically, femoral antiversion, acetabular. All it's saying is that the femur and the acetabulum, the ball and the cup, have to match. One one way and one the other way. And so how do we achieve that? Well, we achieve it by sometimes changing the position of the cup or changing the position of the femur. And that's the only way that you can really fix acetabular dysplasia, hip dysplasia, before there's arthritis. So I'm going to show you why we think this is so significant. When I visited Professor Gons, he, gave, he allowed me to take this case. And it was from the library in Bern where this osteotomy was described, called the Gons osteotomy or the periacetabular osteotomy. And here you have a one-year-old young girl with a dislocated hip. And now we're going to go through the natural history of what happens. So they put the hips back in, and at three years of old, they're still very shallow, the hips, but at least the hips are in the joint, and the child does okay. And now the child's, 12, now the child's 15 years old, or the patient's 15, and they're developing arthritis already. And then someone says, okay, let's put it deeper in the hip. So now they're age 16. And both sides are in the joint. And now they're age 28. Well, this side looks pretty good because it's deep in the cup. This side is doing that point loading, banging on one spot. So by the age of 43, they have complete arthritis, the joint is completely gone, pain, very painful, and the patient under So that's what we're trying to avoid. That is the goal of this treatment. Now, they don't have to have dislocations, so we're gonna produce a joint that's stable, that functions, that doesn't need anything else, no replacement parts, and the screws are just to hold the bone after we move it. So you do an evaluation, we have pain, we talk about the hip itself, we, may get, we probably get an MRI, perhaps a CAT scan, or an MRI to show us the rotation. And we look at all these mechanical numbers that show it to us. And here you see these cysts in front of the hip. That's what this is, a little ball. There's the femoral head in the cup of the acetabulum. And we have 3D modeling with CAT scans. What you can do about it. We have all these choices. Well, you can take anti-inflammatories like you know, like, like ibuprofen or naproxen, which is like Motrin or Aleve. You can take some medications like chondroitin and glucosamine. You can do injections like intraarticular steroids or now PRP and stem cells. But all these things are temporizing. So yes, if you're gonna have a hip replacement, perhaps all these things are useful. But if you wanna save the hip, then you should save it before arthritis develops. And that's why you get down to surgical correction the labrum with an arthroscopy, and then do like a pelvic osteotomy, or wait for a hip replacement. And there are many osteotomies described for pelvic osteotomies. Some are done in young children, called Salter osteotomies, and then you get to what we're doing now, which is a Gans or a osteotomy, and there are some other ones as well. So Bern, a beautiful city in Switzerland, is where, where Reinhold Gans described this, and he wrote about it in 1988. Um, I went to visit him there, and, and this was in the fall, I believe, 92, and here's, or 94, and this was a beautiful picture of, of Bern at that time, and, there, and there's the R. Um, but basically, this was the most stable type of joint um, uh, reconstruction that allowed us to do everything we needed to do to fix hip dysplasia. And if you, if you have a good joint space, which means you don't have arthritis, then you're not going to develop arthritis if you fix it in 90% of the time. Arthritis, then perhaps it'll buy some time, but certainly not work as well. And I use a very small incision along the bikini line, and this just shows a diagram of how you leave the pelvis intact, but just take the cup and move it over the cut of the hip, so the hip is now covered. Here's an example of how we do it. 
that's just in the operating room cutting the hip and this is in 2006 it looks like to me and there you have the way that and this is just how I, I've written some articles on how to avoid these kinds of complications and how, what, how we use specialized osteotomes, which are specialized chisels, and how we have complications doing this. And here's a 36-year-old mother of two who many years ago had this operation to fix her hip. And you can see there's the femoral head, and the ball is not covered by the cup, which is sitting over there. So we've got to get it covered. And there's the cyst, and that just shows how bad this is. And this is a pretty bad case the osteotomy, you see now the head is covered by the socket. And this is all our own bone. We have not used anybody else's bone. And the screws can be removed once the bone heals, usually within four to six months after surgery. 26-year-old mummy with pain at rest, another woman. Again, dysplasia of the hip. And again, just showing and then how we fix it with these. Again, fixing the osteotomy, fixing it. And here's a 22-year-old. So these are just cases showing where you can get the hip seated. And I've probably done this about 600 times um, for patients with really good results if you don't have much arthritis. Showing how now there's coverage. I'm running through these because we'll take questions soon about how to do this, but I wanted to talk about something else. So here you can see there's more arthritis, even in a 16 year old. So age doesn't matter. It just matters how bad the hip is, has developed and you gotta get it covered and that's what we do. So here you see, here's when you have to cut the femur as well osteotomy and the hip is seated and he's about 15 years after that now and some of the youngest patients I did an 11 year old same thing hip is uncovered one of the first ones I did um, showing the hip cover now and, and but you can have arthritis already a marathon or 28 year old severe pain in the hip and but there may be too much arthritis in this case to do a PAO and perhaps that patient should undergo a hip replacement, but she wanted to try it. Actually, she did very well. However, this ex-marine, now that is too much arthritis. There's no joints in the ex-marine, and therefore, even though you can buy some time, eventually that patient will need a hip replacement. So choosing your patient wisely, choosing, choosing surgery wisely, and not waiting until there's arthritis, not just buying time. The truth is you want it as young as you can if you know you have hip dysplasia. The opposite of hip dysplasia is hip impingement. It's a form of dysplasia, but it's actually pressure up against the socket because you're too deep, the, the ball is too deep in the hip. A pretty common ailment as well, and it causes torn labrums. It can often be treated with arthroscopy, but I'm gonna show you an example. You know, a man, and men have this more than women. And you see the bump here is bumping in every time. Well, hip impingement, as opposed to hip, displ hip dysplasia, causes more pain with sitting than it does with walking. So you're sitting on the train going to work, you're sitting in the car driving to work, and that's when the pain develops, and is more significant then. And surgical solutions, arthroscopy, and we talk about whether you dislocate the hip and you can actually create, take the bone away that's, that's in, that is banging up against the surface, or you do a reverse PAO. And here's a young female cheerleader, almost a normal looking hip, except for the fact that the, the MRI shows that right into it. Again, banging into the hip right in this little divot. Dr. Gans, Professor Gans called that a herniation, but basically every time she flexed, she hit this right into this. And there you can see, now for all those who want to close their eyes, if they're scared of looking at surgical, it, and that's what it looks like. So this should be all smooth, and there's the dent in the hip caused by the, um, the impingement. And there's different ways to treat that. This was retreated with a reverse PAO. I mean, they did the same osteotomy, but instead of getting, I got more, less coverage and more coverage in the back. So she wouldn't, every time she walked, she wouldn't bang, every time she, she sat, she wouldn't bang the hip. Here's an 18 year old. And this is a surgical thing showing the bump where he's banging his hip. And again, there's the bump banging. Every time he sat, he would bang into this area. This is Professor Gans performing, and this is, here's the second portion of it. And basically, you can see the no longer banging into it. So there's many, so there's many causes of arthritis of your hip. There's many causes of hip pain, but one common ailment is hip dysplasia or hip impingement.
Depending on at a young age, if you have hip and if you have hip pain, and if you have hip dysplasia, then really buying time is not the answer. Fixing that is the answer. And arthroscopy may be an adjuvant or a start, but not the treatment of hip dysplasia. So we try to treat both impingement, most often with arthroscopy, dysplasia most often with um, surgical correction by the, this periacetabular osteotomy. And I think that differentiating the two and, not, and, and, not, and really knowing you're going to some a surgeon who can read the x-rays and understand that you do have dysplasia and not just tell you to live with it because that used to be the answer. I don't think you have to live with it. And, and I think the patients who I've treated will testify to the fact that their lives change as they, um, as their hip is now stable and they can resume their normal activities in their lives. So I know I said a lot today. That was a pretty fast presentation on hip pain and hip dysplasia. I think it gives you an idea of how to assess your hip pain and, and how to see somebody who can help you to narrow down what is causing this chronic or acute hip pain, which means you either have it for a long time or a short period of time. So these are just describing that these are, these are anatomic the reason why you have them. Certainly everything is genetic. You know, if your mother had a hip replacement when she was 45, then likely you will need a hip replacement when you're 45. Um, and that is it. So we will have any dysplasia or hip impingement. Happy to answer any questions out there. Uh, this uh, March 19th, what is today's day? March 16th. 16th. 2018. Inverted six. Yeah, so we have one question. Um, Jenny Nicolau asks, uh, my son had surgery last year in Australia and they placed growing rods. I now live in Greece and worry in case he falls. Should I worry? So that's a spine question. Growing rods are rods in the spine. That's not related to hip today, but basically, I mean, I think you should speak to your surgeons. I mean, growing rods are very secure, but that's not really the hip today. So we'll try to uh, answer that question when we discuss growing rods. But yes, I think that you know, you need to speak to the surgeons who put the growing rods in the spine to discuss what the limitations are for activity. All right, so we sign off today on hip dysplasia and, uh, and happy to uh, take any emails uh, through our Facebook page and Facebook Live uh, to discuss uh, uh, this topic. And thank you and have a great weekend. We're out. That was cool.